Thank you, Father, for this opportunity to learn more about you, to study your word. We ask that you'll open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts so that we can see, hear, and understand what your word says. We thank you in the name of Yahushua. Amen. So, I'm a little congested. Nobody freak out. I don't have COVID. Um, I breathed in enough insulation to last. Yeah, I'm warm on the inside right now. Uh, and then I, I, they were throwing away this huge, I mean, it was half the size of the room piece of floor insulation, which is looking R19. So I said, ah, I'll just roll it up and put it in the back of the van. So I rolled it up and put it in the back of the van. But what happens when you drive down the road with your windows open? It blows around. So I was coughing and hacking, and I thought I was going to die on the way home, but I made it. So there we go. Huh? Oh, I'm, I'm good. Yeah. Yeah, I've got it. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you, thank you. All right. So let's take a look at Shemot. Let's take a look at um, Shemot. Shemot means, anybody? Huh? Names? Names. Shemot. Exodus is what we call it because from a Greco-Roman mindset, well, this is, we left. They left Egypt, right? But Shemot means names. Now, Elohim doesn't have a whole bunch of names. His name is Yahuwah but he has a bunch of titles, okay? But what's in a name? What's in a, what's in a name? What's in a name? Yorche Vavhe from the ancient text, okay? Yorche Vavhe. Our strength is in our perception, and it's attached to what we perceive. He says, I am that I am. I will prove to be what I will prove to be. So, um, Shem, we look at Shem also as a name. What do we have? We have a root that goes to this word and it also goes to this word Shamar and Shema okay so within the name what we perceive is attached to our perception is Shamar what we treasure what we guard what we observe and also, what we perceive, discern, understand, obey, apply to our lives. And it also is what we are content in. Shema means to be content as well. Okay? So, when, the child, when Moses, okay, because this is, uh, we'll start at uh, verse 3, Exodus 3, Exodus um, 3. 14. So it's up here somewhere. Exodus 3, 14. And Elo, Moses asked a question. Okay, so let's back up a little bit. What's happened? The children of Israel left Canaan and went to Egypt. Okay? And they went to Egypt and they settled into the land of Goshen, which was the, the most uh, awesome piece of land Egypt had to offer. It had uh, plush fields for their cattle and, and water and all kinds of wonderful things. I mean, it was like, it, it was like getting the $300 ribeye, okay? So they got the, the best part of Egypt. And they settled in and they started to do their thing. Well, over the time, the Pharaoh and Joseph and all that generation starts to die off. So Pharaoh, uh, the new Pharaoh is worried that the children of Israel, the Hebrews, are starting to get just a little bit too large and a little bit too powerful. So um, in the Torah, we really don't get a whole lot other than 
it goes straight to telling us that they were persecuted and, and all this other stuff. It's in the book of Jasher that we actually figure out what happened. What happened? The Hebrews got greedy. It wasn't that they got powerful, they got greedy. And Pharaoh makes them an offer. He says, I have a bunch of construction projects. I would like you, the Hebrews, to join your Egyptian counterparts and do these construction projects. We're going to pay you really nicely. You're going to have nice wages, health insurance. You're going to have life insurance. You're going to have all the stuff that you need. Um, you know, great 401k and all this other stuff. So the Hebrews jump on it, except for the tribe of Levi who says, yeah, that's probably not a good idea. All right. We see this happening today as well, and we'll get to that in a minute. So the Hebrews join the Egyptians, and they go, and they start doing the counterparts, or start doing these construction projects. And then what happens? The Egyptians slowly start to back away to the point where the Hebrews are now doing all the work. They're still getting paid, but then they back away some more, and the wages start to go down until eventually the wages fall off, and the Hebrews are left as slaves doing all the work, okay? And in the process of doing this, they are assigned taskmasters, and this is where the brutality comes in, and they start to really suffer. So the greed that they had brought them to a point where they were miserable, okay? But who did the children of Israel know? Did they know Yahuwah Elohim? They knew Yahuwah Elohim, but they had been so into Egyptian culture that they put more of their confidence in Ra or Osiris or uh, Isis or any of the other uh, deities of Egypt. So we read on that they started to cry out to Elohim. Now I can cry out to Elohim. Which Elohim am I crying out to? This is part of Shemot. What force, what power do you put your, your faith in? But we read in that that they finally started to cry out to the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when they cried out to the Elohim, okay, Elohim, we loosely translate that as something called God. God is a really, really poor translation. Um, we, uh, it comes from the root from a Teutonic deity, Godin, which uh, Michelangelo so vividly painted on the Sistine Chapel. You see the old man with the nice flowing white beard, much nicer than mine, dressed in white robes, reaching out to Adam. Okay, so this is our picture of something called God now. Elohim from an ancient perspective, means a power, a force, a mighty something. Elohim comes from the root ayil, that means ram, that is an instrument of redemption, deliverance, restoration. And it's also the root of the word terebinth, the, the oak tree, the big tree that is a symbol of rest within the Torah. So Elohim is a mighty force that has the ability to not only judge, but has the ability to deliver us, restore us, heal us, bring us rest. And if we say Yahuwah is Elohim, then Yahuwah comes from the root Chaya, that means to exist and to have existed, and the root Yihye, that means to, exi uh, to exist in the future. So in Yahuwah, we have this idea of at every time, at every moment, in every aspect, we have a mighty judge who, is, who has the authority to redeem, deliver, restore, heal, and bring us rest. Okay? What do we perceive? The children of Israel finally called out to the right Elohim. And when they called out to the right Elohim, he heard them. And when he heard them, he had already set a plan in motion with Moses. He had, who was Moses? Moses was born during a period of time that the Hebrew boys would be thrown into the Nile 
um, at birth. They were supposed to be killed at birth by the, by the midwives, but the midwives uh, didn't play that game, so Pharaoh came up with another plan, just throw them into the Nile. Well, um, Moses' mother puts him in a basket. We all know the story, and the basket flows down the Nile, and the princess of, of Egypt finds him, and she raises him as his son. So Moses, who was Moses, spends 40 years in the court of Pharaoh, learning how to be a leader. Well, Moses is still hooked on his Hebrew roots. So he kills an Egyptian defending another Hebrew, and he runs away. He spends 40 years in the wilderness learning how to be a shepherd. Okay? And if we look at the book of Jasher, it tells us a slightly different story, that he becomes a king and he fights a battle against Africa and is victorious. Only after having spent 25 years locked in a cage, being fed pieces of bread by his wife Zipporah until Jethro finally releases him. So Moses, you know, we take it 40 years in Egypt learning to be a king, and we can take it either way, 40 years in the wilderness learning to be a shepherd, or 40 years learning how to run a kingdom, but finally, he's out taking care of the flocks, and he is distracted by a bush that happens to be burning. Okay? A burning bush is an interesting concept in a burning bush. You know, when you see a, when you think of a burning bush, you know, you think of fire, right? That's a nice fire. And then things coming out. But you can equate a burning bush to the, later, the letter Shem. Okay? So now Moses is locked into having to make a choice. He can choose to continue doing things from his point of view, or he can choose to do things from Elohim's point of view. So he approaches the bush, and the bush talks to him. I guess there was peyote out there. I don't know. But anyway, he talks to the bush. He's talking to the bush. Hopefully nobody's watching him talk to the bush. And the bush tells him to do what? Take off your shoes, for the ground that you are walking on is holy ground. Okay, so there's no word for holy in Hebrew. The word kadosh means something that is set apart. This ground that you're walking on is dedicated to a specific purpose. Take off your shoes. Why take off your shoes? The hmm? The hands. Well. Okay. Huh? I think it's a form of insulation. It could be a form of insulation. We can get into that. You know, you let the energy flow up through your body. You walk on the grass and bare feet for about 30 minutes a day. You feel better. Bare feet. Okay. But there's more to it than that. There's an ancient Hebrew tradition that if, uh, let's take uh, Boaz and, is it Bo Boaz and Ruth as an example. Boaz goes to Ruth's closest relative at the gate and tells him, hey, you're going to inherit this land. You got this land that you can claim if you want. And the guy says, yeah, I want the land. Oh, by the way, it comes with a wife. So he takes his shoe off and it hands it to Boaz. What is he saying? I don't want to redeem it. Okay? It's an ancient tradition. If I don't want to redeem something, I take my shoe off and give it to the other person saying, you can redeem it. So take off your shoes because the land that you're walking on is set apart to a specific purpose. What is he saying? Right off the bat, Elohim is telling Moses, you are not the redeemer. Okay? You are not the Redeemer. Right. So, only Yahweh Elohim can redeem. No one else can redeem. So, Moses understands this now, and Elohim begins to tell Moses, you're going to go and pick up the children of Israel, bring them out of Egypt, and you're going to take them to the land where they belong. 
And Moses asks a question. And finally, we get to the question in Shemot that we, we need to get to. Exodus 3.14. And Elohim said to Moses, I am that I am. Thus you will say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Okay? So I am that I am. Okay? Ayer he ayer. I am that I am. I am is the word chaya, to exist. Chaya also means to be a beacon to, to be committed to, and to help to accomplish. Okay? Literally, when we read this in the Hebrew, it doesn't say, I am that I am. What it says is, um, it's on the previous page. I thought I was kind of. I thought I was starting in the middle. Anyway, what it actually says is, "I am that which exists." I am that which exists. In other words, what he's telling Moses is, "Go tell them that I am the only real force. Ra does not exist. Osiris doesn't exist. Isis doesn't exist. If you are going to follow me." You have to understand that I am the only one that exists. And in Yahuwah, I exist now, I exist later, and I have always existed in the past. Okay? So, to exist now and to exist into the future. I am has sent me to you. Okay? So tell them, I am has sent me to you. Tell me that that which exists has sent me, Moses, to you. So, Moses, Moshe, means to draw out. To draw out. Okay, because he was drawn out of the Nile. So, Moshe means to draw out. So, Yahuwah sends something to draw out, that they must draw out from in order to escape their bondage. What do we have that allows us to draw from to escape from our bondage. Hmm? We have Torah. We have the word of Elohim within it. Within the word of Elohim are the answers to just about every problem that we can fathom. I've still yet to find the answer to how to remove an oil filter when it's stuck and you've rammed a screwdriver through it and torn the filter up. I haven't found that in there. But I'm sure somewhere in there, it's in there. But, uh, okay. So, what do you draw from? What do you draw from? Shemot now becomes a very important question, especially considering where we're at now, okay? We've had a presidential election that's been a fiasco. Let's use that. It's the biggest thing that's going on, okay? We have one president that did a lot of things. We have another, well, a new president that spent 47 years in Congress and didn't do much of anything. But for some reason, the one that has done a lot is no longer president, and the one that's done nothing is now president. And everybody's freaking out about it. Oh, there's going to be full food shortages, and we're falling into socialism, and gas prices are going to go up, and blah, 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 blah. What do you draw from? What becomes your deity? Okay. What do you treasure? What do you guard? What do you perceive, discern, and understand? It's all within the name. Okay. Your perception, your, the strength of your perception is attached to what you perceive. Okay. So Shemot now forces us to ask a question. What do you draw from? Do you draw from that which exists, is a beacon, is committed to you, and will help you to accomplish what you set your hand to accomplish? Or is it something else? Okay. We look at the book of Chazon, the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation gives us an equation to how things come and go. And that equation is 
uh, one of those equations is that you'll have three and a half years of peace and security followed by three and a half years of misery. Okay, well, we've had three and a half years of peace and security. Now we have three and a half years of we don't know what's going to happen. All right? Do you freak out, wig out, and stress out about it? No. Okay. Because Shemot is telling us that I am he that exists. And if he is the one that exists, if Elohim is, if Yahuwah Elohim is the one that exists, then why not bind yourself to your Elohim? And this becomes a very important question found within this letter. which is Het, okay? Het. All Hebrew letters are composed of other Hebrew letters with the exception of the Yod. The Yod stands by itself. All letters are created by the Yod. No letter can be created without the Yod. When the pen touches the paper, the Yod is formed. When the pen leaves paper, the Yod is complete and it leaves a letter in between. For example, the Yod is began, we form a letter Vav, and when it leaves, um, we have a letter Vav. So the Yod has the power to bring creation into being. It has the power to manifest things. Yod is also the root letter of the name Yahuwah. Okay? But in this case, we have a Zion that is yoked to a Vav. This is the first choice in Het. What do you yoke yourself to? Okay? In this case, the Vav is yoked to the protection. Zion means weapon. But it comes from the root Zan that means nourishment. And it's the seventh letter of the alphabet, so we get an idea of rest, the seventh day. So do we yoke ourselves to the protection, nourishment, and rest that comes from Elohim by and through his word? Or the ancient Paleo-Hebrew pictograph of Het, is a wall. The first time that we see Het as the root of a word is in the word Chabed. Chabed means to hide, to be hidden. And it says, and they hid themselves. They did something they weren't supposed to do, and instead of Acknowledging that they had eaten from the tree they weren't supposed to eat from, they hid themselves and they clothed themselves in, in fig leaves, right? So the other choice in Het then is I can hide behind a wall. Het, as a word, comes from the root chatat that means to stray away. Okay? Sin is an overrated word. Sin, as a word, comes to us from... Uh, the Roman Empire because we have to have something evil in our lives that we do that causes us to um, I guess be bad and if we're bad then we're there's a punishment and, and all this other stuff. The Greco-Roman idea is that we can be full of sin but we cannot be full of straying away. The concept of sin as the Greco-Roman ideology gives us doesn't exist in Hebrew. You either walk on the path or you don't walk on the path. So I can be hidden behind a wall because I have strayed away from the protection, nourishment, and rest of my Elohim. Okay? And that becomes a very important concept in Shemot. Okay? So what's in the name? What's in the name? We turn the page, and we go far, far away from, we go 17 chapters down the road to chapter 20, which is no longer anywhere close to the Torah portion of Shemot. The Torah portion of Shemot begins at Exodus 1 and carries itself through about midway through Exodus 6, okay? But here on, in Exodus 20, we get to um, the Ten Commandments. Now, they're not Ten Commandments. They're not commandments. 
There are ten debarim, there are ten words. And debar can mean a commandment, but it means more specifically a proclamation or a declaration. I declare this to you. I proclaim this to you. I suggest this to you. I'm making suggestions to you on how to live your life. And it starts with, Anohi Yahua Elohecha. I am Yahua your Elohim. I'm the one who, let me read it, because I, I'm better at reading it. I am Yahua your Elohim, which has brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. Okay? I'm the one who delivers you. Moses isn't delivering you. I'm delivering you. Okay? Anohi Yahua Elohecha. Anohi is a word that means I am. So why does he use Anohi as opposed to using Haya? Because Anohi is a personal um, statement. Anohi is a personal statement. I am introducing myself to you. I am not explaining to you what I am. Haya is an explanation of what he is, the one that exists. He is making this relationship personal. Anohi Yahua Elohecha. I am the one who brings you out of Egypt. I am Yahua, your Elohim. And he uses the word Elohecha. Why is the word Elohecha so important compared to the word Elohechem that also means your? Elohechem, I can say your. I'm talking to the whole group. There's nothing personal in that word. Elohecha, however, I'm talking directly to you, Noah. Directly to you. This is a personal statement to you. And he is to take this back to the children of Israel and says, to each one of you as individuals, I am your Elohim. And my name is Yahuwah. And to each one of you as individuals in every aspect of your life, at every moment that you exist, I am there to watch over you, redeem you, deliver you, restore you, heal you, bring you rest. But keep in mind that I'm also there to judge what you do, to see, make sure that you do it right. Okay? And if you stray off course, well, I'm going to give you something here shortly that will help you to get back on course because he, the Torah hasn't been given as of this point. We have highlights of the Torah all throughout um, the first chapter, but now the Torah is actually begin, going to be given. Now let's keep in mind, what was the curse that was given to Adam? And when I say Adam, I'm not talking about the first guy. I'm talking about Adam. Adam is a word that means humankind in Hebrew. So it was given to both men and women. Okay. I lost my train of thought. What was I saying? The curse. The curse. The curse. There we go. The curse. The curse was given to both men and women. What was the curse? That when you plant stuff in the ground, you'll get a yield, but it's going to grow thorns and thistles. You're going to have to struggle to get what you want out of there. What's the first commandment given to humankind? Anybody? Be fruitful and multiply. We always look at that as a form of, oh, procreation, you got to fill the earth. But to be fruitful and multiply literally means do something with your life. Do something with the life I'm giving you. But if we hatat, then how do we do something with the life? We do it from the other side of Shin. What is Shin? I have the front side of Shin that is Elohim's point of view, and I have the back side of Shin that's my point of view, based on the enticements of the Satan. Ooh, ah, Satan, little guy, wears a red cape, carries a pitchfork, right? Satan comes from the root Shatim that means unbridled, unrestrained emotions. What gets us to stray off course? Is it a little guy in a red suit telling us that we have to do something? Or do we make the choices that cause us to stray off course? Okay? Um, 
We talked about Lucifer last night. Lucifer is simply a Greek word that means a morning star. Okay? Lucifer is not the name of something we call Satan. If we were going to give him a name, we would have to go to the Book of Jubilees, and there's a cat in there by the name of Mastema, who's the quality control guy for the kingdom of heaven. He says, boss, giving all this prosperity to Abraham isn't a good idea. Why don't you check him out first? Make sure that he's, he's on the level. And all of him tells him, okay, well, go down and do something. And this is where we have, hey, you have to offer up Isaac. Okay? Shittim, though, the enticements of the Satan, the enticements of your emotion is what force you to allow your point of view to override Elohim's point of view. Can we override Elohim's point of view? We can, because we are human beings. We are created in such a way that we have something called free will that allows us to make choices. Now, is overriding Elohim's point of view necessarily a bad thing? We're created to override that point of view. But if I want to go from A to B, my point of view is, well, B's right there, A's right here. Obviously, I should just be able to step over there, and I'm at B. And it doesn't work out that way because Elohim's point of view says, no, you have to go visit Z first, then come back to H, and then go to J, come back to F, and then you can go to B. Okay? So we don't always want to take Elohim's point of view. We want our own point of view. So that leads us to the uh, second commandment that says, uh, well, it's actually, it's still part of the first commandment. You shall have no other Elohim before me. You shall have no other Elohim before me. So we can take this from a topical point of view that he's telling the children of Israel, I am Yahweh, your Elohim. It's a personal relationship. You cannot worship Ra or Osiris or Isis or any of the other ones. You can't worship a golden calf. The golden calf was a big deity in Egypt. I am your Elohim. So how do we bring that into a personal note? Who's freaking out about the future of the country? Who's freaking out about um, whether you're going to be able to pay your bills? Who's freaking out about all kinds of other things? Because those are deities. We look at this verse and says, You shall have no other Elohim before me. And we have to look at a word in that verse that is used for have no other. And the word for have no other in this verse is... Dun, dun, dun. Achar. Achar. Achar is a word that means to hinder. Okay? So instead of saying, you shall have no other Elohim before me, what we, what we actually look at is you shall not be hindered by other Elohim. Do I allow other Elohim to hinder me? What's in a name? Well, what's in a name is that the strength of my perception is attached to the things that I perceive. Okay? Do I allow other Elohim to hinder me? If he says, Anohi Yahuwah Elohecha, I am your Elohim. And if he says, Ayeche Eye, that I am that I am, or I am that which exists, then what power does the other Elohim have over me? The power that the other Elohim have over me is that I allow Shittim to enter into my life that does what? Cause me to get emotionally involved in anything other than my relationship with my Elohim. And this is where it becomes a big thing. I had a young lady ask me last night, um, what do I do? My company is um, closing its doors. I've been offered a retirement package it's a nice package. I can take the package or I can transfer to another store 
that isn't closing its doors and continue to work or I can take this package and uh, get into something that I actually want to do. And I can draw my 401k out after 20 something years of being with this company and do this. And my question to her was, have you sat down and had a conversation with Elohim? Okay, I can't tell you what to do. Um, somebody else, she asked another question down the road. Well, I'll get to that question later, but I can't tell you what to do. Prayer is an overrated word. People say, oh, you can't say that. The idea of what I, I, I give something called God three or four minutes of my time and something called prayer. Oh God, what do I do? I, you know, give me the answers that I need. Amen. Okay. My children come to me and they ask for advice. We sit down at the table and we pour a cup of coffee and we sit there and have a conversation. They tell me what's on their mind and I mull it over, take a sip of coffee, take a bite of a cookie or a cake or whatever's there. Usually, I hope for scones, but they're never there. And we hash it out. Our relationship with our Elohim has to be the same thing, and this is where we lack, okay? Anohi Yahuwah Elohecha, I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. It's a personal introductory statement. Eyecha Eye, I am that which exists. So here we go in saying, what is the difference between saying, and we've talked about this a number of times, but it becomes so absolutely critical in this book of Shemot. What is the difference in saying, I believe in God, or I am aware that Yahuwah Elohim is present? Okay? I believe there's dinosaurs in the Amazon rainforest. I can't prove it. I can believe it all I want. But I can have a relationship with Noah. I can have a relationship with Sharla. I have a relationship with Carrie, Alan, Mickey and Ed, Bonnie, Kenneth, Doug, Michael, everyone, Sister E. I know that they are real. I know he. I am Sister Elaine. I am Carrie. Hi. And I can sit down and have a conversation with you. Why can I not sit down and have a conversation with my Elohim? Same paradigm. Fix a cup of tea. Find the blueberry scones. And have a conversation. And say, my store is closing. I have 20 years worth of 401k. They're offering me a very generous uh, package to just quit. Um, this is what I want to do. I want to teach. I, I've been teaching online. I think I could do well in the classroom. Um, I don't know how, quite how to go about all this. And I am speaking to my Elohim just like I'm speaking to you right now. Here's the difference between that and prayer. What is prayer? Can you hear me? Anybody hear me? No. Carrie, hi. I'm getting a retirement package. And, you know, and, and, and this. Okay, you can hear me now. I'm speaking to my Elohim out loud. I'm speaking as if he is actually there, and I'm laying out what my plan is. Then I have a piece of paper and a pencil, and I begin to write down the thoughts that come into my head. And then I have a game plan because I've had a conversation, okay? And the voice is very much real, okay? But what happens when I put Elohim in the way that hinder me? I begin to think of all the reasons why I shouldn't do something as opposed to sitting down and having a conversation and listening to the, to the steps that I should take to get what I hope to manifest in my life. Sometimes... <coughs> The steps that I get in order to get what I hope to manifest in my life are, don't do that, that's a stupid idea. 
And then I go out and do it anyway. And I end up here instead of here. And then I have to get back to here. And this is what the children of Israel did in Shemot. They finally realized that they had gotten in over their heads and an Elohim called greed had caused them to sink. Okay, so that takes us down to uh, verse 4 of chapter 20 that is a long, long ways away from where our Torah portion is. You shall not make unto yourself any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or is it in the earth beneath or is in the water or under the earth. Okay, so what is a graven image? Is it a statue or a painting? Or can it be any thought that I bring into manifestation? Okay? Don't create Elohim. That's basically what it's saying. But we create Elohim every day. Many of us will create Elohim by the time we get home that we have to fight and struggle to get over. Okay? Don't create these things. Anochi Yahuwah Elohecha. I am Yahweh your Elohim. I'm the one that's here. Yoke yourself to me and receive my protection, nourishment, and rest. But what causes us to create Elohim? It says, you shall not bow down yourself to them nor serve them. For I am Yahuwah your Elohim. I am a jealous El, visiting iniquity of the fathers unto the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Okay. Hate is kind of a strong word. Um, what do we have in this? Okay. We have a, a word um, that is basically shane, to hate. But shane is something that means more than just to hate. It means something to uh, separate you from me to make me your enemy. Can Elohim become our enemy? Mm -hmm. We allow him to become our enemy. Mm -hmm. Elohim will either be with us or he will draw himself away from us. But he's never something that is against us. <coughs> Elohim can be absent from our lives because we choose for him to be absent. Why do we choose for him to be absent? the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me, the third and the fourth generation of them that cause this rift between me and them. So what is a third and the fourth generation? Are we talking about third and fourth generations of people? Or is the Torah telling us, giving us a formula as to how to not become separated from our Elohim? The third, third letter of the Aleph Beit. Anybody? Aleph Beit. Kimmel. Gimel. Gimel. Gimel is the Vav being held up by another Vav. Okay? Or we can look at it as the Vav being held up by a Yod. Which one do you prefer? Can the flesh be held up by the flesh? Sure. Can the Flesh be held up by the power of Elohim, of course. Which one do you choose? Becomes a choice in that. Gimel is a Hebrew word for camel. Okay? The Gimel represents a wealthy man, but the Kimmel also represents pride and arrogance. Okay? So what causes a rift between me and my Elohim? Pride. Why? What do you do with a camel? You pack him up. It's a pack animal. Pride leads to us overloading ourselves because I can do all things through me who strengthens me. It's in the book of Hezekiah. There is no book of Hezekiah. All right. Okay. Pride. You know, Yahushua says that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a wealthy man to enter into the kingdom. So we all have this perception of trying to shove a big camel through the eye of a needle, right? The eyes are little gates that go into Jerusalem. 
but a packed camel can't go through the eye. But you can unpack the camel and get it down on its knees and it'll fit through nicely. And then you can bring all your stuff in and put it on top. Okay? If we want to enter into a relationship with our Elohim, we can't be bogged down. The third generation says that it's pride. Our desire to do all things through us because it's what strengthens us is what keeps us out of the relationship with our Elohim. The children of Israel fell into greed, and that's what separated them from Elohim. We have this same exact story repeated after Alexander conquers Judea. And through Alexander, uh, the, the Hebrew people are given a tremendous amount of liberty to the point where they want to become Greeks, going as far as to reverse circumcision so they can play in the, in the games and all this stuff. And this is what the battle between the Maccabees uh, and these Hellenized Jews was. It was a civil war. Okay? But the children of Israel have bogged themselves down. So pride is a third generation that begins the separation. Gimel, <coughs> the wealthy man, chases after Dalit, the poor man. Dalit, from the root Dalut, means poverty, specifically spiritual poverty. So the third generation, when I get greedy and arrogant in my relationship with my Elohim, I separate myself from my Elohim, then I suffer or I enter into, not necessarily suffering because I don't realize that I'm suffering from it, I enter into a state of spiritual poverty. You can take a frog and put it in a pan of water and raise the heat slowly and the frog never realizes it's boiling to death until it's too late. Okay, and This is where our separation from our Elohim comes into being. It's a slow process, but eventually it gets to a point where uh, we can still go back, but it can get to a point where we simply don't want to go back. And Paul calls this a reprobate mind. It's, it's a mind that is set totally and completely against anything that has to do with a relationship with Elohim. So the third and the fourth generation that make themselves an enemy of me that separate themselves from me are the ones that create Elohim to hinder the relationship that we have together. Okay? So I fail in understanding a yeha a ye, that he is the one that exists. And I fail to recognize Anohiyahua Elohecha that I can have a personal relationship with my Elohim. But then it goes down but showing mercy, and the word is chesed, showing compassion, kindness, understanding to the thousandth generation of them that love me. So what is a thousand? The thousand brings us here, away from here. The tav is the farthest point from the aleph. The Aleph is the closest point to Elohim. The Aleph has a numerical value in Aluf of a thousand. That my, rep, that my relationship can be built on my understanding that my Elohim is compassionate. My Elohim is patient. He's kind. He's loving. And that I can go and reach the closest point to him if I will simply shed all the stuff that hinders me from having this relationship. But in order to shed what keeps me from having this relationship, I have to pay attention to what's in the name because the strength of my per perception is attached to the things that I perceive. How do I perceive the world around me? Do I perceive the world around me as... Uh, falling apart and I'm going to be caught in the middle of a great tribulation and I don't know what I'm going to do or do I perceive the world around me as yes it's got problems but I have a relationship with something that's greater than those problems okay tribulation 
is a part of life. We don't gain experience without tribulation. The Greek word is thalipsis. The Hebrew word is czar. They mean the same thing. It means to crush something, to extract something valuable. And the, the uh, example of czar or thalipsis is to k take an olive and to put it in an olive press, and you crush the olive, and what do you get from the olive when it's crushed? You get oil, okay? Oil is truth. But in order to get to that truth, I have to allow myself to be crushed so that the chaff is removed. We started off in that the fruit of the ground would yield only through thorns and thistles. The Torah, was given at Sinai. The instructions of Elohim was given at a place called thorns and thistles. That in order for me to understand what my Elohim is saying to me, I have to be willing to remove the brambles around it. But the idea of thorns and thistles evolves in the Torah, and it evolves to the threshing floor. That in order to extract the grains of wheat, I have to crush the, that in order to remove the chaff to, to get to the wheat. Philipsis, and that evolves into something we call tribulation. Philipsis, or czar. That in order to get to the truth, I have to be willing to extract all the garbage that's around the truth. Okay? And this is what becomes so important in Shemot, in that within the name I learn what I need to treasure, I, need, I learn what I need to perceive, discern, and understand, apply, obey, and be content in, in my life. Okay? Um, whoop, wait. Usually I have notes written all over the place. How do I do all this? How do I do all this? We have a fourth commandment. And the fourth commandment is actually stated the first time in Bereshi's chapter 2. He said, And Yahweh Elohim stopped his work on the seventh day, and he set the seventh day apart. Okay? It tells us here that remember the Sabbath day. Remember the seventh day. It doesn't say remember to stop on this day. In Hebrew, it literally says, remember the seventh day. In six days I worked, the seventh day I rested. What are you supposed to rest from? It says, on the seventh day, don't work. Don't have your maidservant work or your manservant work. Don't put your ox to work. You know, it's just everything. So I don't have any maidservants. I don't have any manservants. I don't have any oxen, unless grandchildren are included in that, um, the older ones. So what is, what is the deal with maidservants, men servants, oxen, and all that other stuff? During the week, I have maidservants and manservants and oxen. During the week, I have preoccupations with a whole bunch of things. But I need to stop on the seventh day and let those preoccupations go away. Give those things a rest. Give the things that I freak out, wig out, and stress about during the week a rest. But it's not only about that. Once a week, take some time to sit down and have that long conversation with your Elohim. Um, I have a pastor friend of mine that he tells his congregation, hey, you know, during the week, try to read three chapters a day. But on Sunday... Read five. And the principle is the same. During the week, we have another formula for staying in tune. I'll talk about that formula in a minute. But on the seventh day, we have no excuse to not sit down someplace peaceful, someplace quiet, fix ourselves our snack, fix ourselves our drink, and have an extended conversation with our Elohim. Take some time to go somewhere in that word that um, were led to go to and read. I've spent a lot of time in the book of Ecclesiastes over the last few months. So 
the commandment after he introduces himself and tells us that we need to shed our baggage is to stop and take an account of how much of that we've shed and share that with our Elohim. During the week we have something else and that recourse is given to us in Deuteronomy where, it's, where Moses says, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Elohenu Yahweh Echad. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh your Elohim, Yahweh is one. And you shall um, talk about it when you rise up, talk about it on the way, and talk about it when you go to bed. That's three times a day, Shema Yisrael. What is Shema Yisrael? Hear, O Israel. Why did Yahushua say this is the first most important commandment? He didn't say, love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. He made a statement. Then he says, love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart, your mind, your strength. Then he says, love your neighbor as yourself. But Shema Yisrael, we've talked about this a number of times, but it becomes even more important when we consider Shemot, is Shema Yisrael. Do I perceive, discern, understand, obey, apply, and am I content in Yisrael, the authority of Elohim? Yahuwah Eloheinu. Am I aware that in every aspect of my life, at every moment that I exist, I have a mighty judge who has the authority to redeem me, deliver me, restore me, heal me, and bring me rest. And Yahuwah Echad. Echad means one, but it also means to be in agreement. Am I in agreement with Yahuwah? The numerical value of Echad is 13. The 13th letter of the Aleph Bet is the Mem. The mem is a representation of the word. Am I in agreement with the instructions that my Elohim has given me? Because if I am in agreement with those instructions, then I am also echad with Yahuwah. And echad also means to be in unity with. I am also on the same page. And I do this three times a day during the week to keep me in line. Okay? Three times a day a day during the week, I can cry out to Elohim in my Egypt and he will hear me and bring me out. And this becomes the importance of Shemot. Three times a day during the week, I can call out to my Elohim and say, this is where the strength of my perception is. This is what has got me attached to what I perceive. Am I right or am I wrong? Am I hiding behind something? How do I get out of this and yoke myself to you again? Okay? <clears throat> so Shemot becomes a very important Torah portion for us. And in light of everything that's going on in the world, you know, I, can, I could easily say, oh, if you have flower beds, dig up your flowers and plant vegetables, which is not a bad idea. Get your guns and make sure you have your ammo. For what? If you get guns and ammo, go hunt Bambi. You know, it's not going to go well if you try to go hunt government people. I could, you know, everybody's, this is what you read all over social media. It's, it's I want to get off, I'm about to delete the whole thing because it's nothing but nonsense. I could say all that stuff, but what would that be doing? I would be giving you Elohim to hide behind that would hinder you from your relationship with your Elohim. Now, if you sit down with your tea and your scones and have a conversation and Elohim says, go dig up your daisies and plant zucchini, then maybe go dig up your daisies and plant zucchini. But he also says, trust in me. What are the two witnesses that die in Revelation? Anybody have an idea? We have topical things. It's Moses and Elijah or something that, that die. But what's going to die, the two witnesses that die, are the spirit of Elohim and the word of Elohim. When those two things die, then we are left here. Who can stop those two witnesses from dying? We can. Okay? 
The world waxed cold. The world will wax cold. Why will the world, why will the world wax cold? Twice waiting that sweet times. Because people are more attached to their doctrines than they are attached to a relationship with their Elohim. Doctrines will fail. Takanot, rabbinical decree, will fail. But the word of Elohim doesn't change. He says in Malachi, I am Yahuwah, I do not change. His word doesn't change. Yahushua said, until heaven and earth pass away, the Torah remains. Okay? We have a means of restoration given to us. And that means of restoration is found within the name. And we have to reach out to that name in order for us to be able to move forward through whatever philipsis or th sar or whatever you want to call it comes our way. And that's Shemot in a nutshell. A really big nutshell. Yes, ma'am. Sure. And that's, you know, you stop and you don't, again, you don't hinder anyone around you as well. You know, oftentimes the oxen get stuck in the ditch. You know, there's times, I'm fortunate my employer knows what I do on Shabbat and says, don't come to work. What you're doing on Shabbat is more important than coming here and looking at houses. We don't expect you to be here. Um, but there's people that have to, you know. Take the time to stop. And, and this, this is, to me, this is where the Shema begins to apply on the seventh day. Because on the seventh day, you can stop three times a day and examine where you are. And then when you finally stop where you're at, then take that time to stop, thoroughly stop. But don't hinder anyone else either. Um, be the Torah to others around you. I can't go and tell someone to become Torah observant. But they can look at me and look at the life that I lead and hopefully something in that will open their eyes to spark them to want to be. Um, Alan, your granddaughter, Chloe, made a comment about you on Facebook that, that, and it was, you know, it was a very emotional comment that she looks at you as a personification of what it is to be someone who's in Mashiach, and that's, that was a beautiful thing. But, you know, without saying a word, she saw what you were doing. And that's an example, you know, without saying a word, who can look at us and say, that's what I want to be. And that's what true ministry becomes. You know, the Great Commission is go into the world and make disciples. But how do I go into a world to make disciples of people who don't want to hear it? Sometimes, you know, I'll be the only Bible that people will ever read. Then, once they've read that, I can begin to slowly immerse them in the knowledge of the Father, His restoration, and the relationship they can have with His Spirit. So, yeah, absolutely. Well, and even if you have to work, you can take time to honor. That's what it says. Well, yeah. Remember it and honor. Yeah, remember. Take time. It says remember. Zikra, remember. It's a reminder. The seventh day is a reminder that, hey, I'm here. What you got? Bring it on. I'll take two lumps of sugar in my tea. I haven't gotten to the point where I, I set out two cups, but I'm getting there. <laughs> anyway. <laughs>